Now, as the meditator continues with his practice of serenity meditation, continues developing concentration, he arouses in his mind five mental factors which are repeatedly strengthened and reinforced by his efforts. These mental factors are called the five factors of absorption, the five jhana factors. They are initial application, sustained application, rapture, happiness, and one-pointedness. Initial application, vitaka, is the mental factor of applying the mind to the object. It is said to have the function of lifting the mind up and directing it to the object. It makes the mind strike again and again at the object. The second factor, sustained application, is the continuation of that. It's the factor of continued pressure on the object. This factor keeps the mind occupied with the object, examining it, applying the mind again and again to the object, keeping the mind anchored on the object. The difference between Initial application and sustained application is illustrated in the text in this way. Initial application is like the striking of a bell. Sustained application is like the reverberation of the bell. Or initial application is like a bird striking its wings to go up into the air. Sustained application is like the bird continuing in flight. Initial application is gross, sustained application is subtle. Initial application brings the mind to the object, sustained application fixes the mind on the object. Then the third factor is rapture of piti. This is pleasurable interest in the object, interest which can range all the way from a momentary thrill of delight with the practice of meditation, all the way up to overwhelming ecstasy, where the body and mind are flooded with rapture, with ecstasy. Then the fourth factor of absorption is happiness or bliss, sukha. Happiness is the pleasant feeling that accompanies the practice. It's something that's somewhat different from rapture. Happiness is a feeling, whereas rapture is a full state of mind. And happiness begins as a new kind of pleasure, pleasure which is purer and more peaceful than sense pleasure. And then as it's developed, it rises up to the height of bliss, to very pure, tranquil bliss. Then the fifth jhana factor is one-pointedness of mind. That is concentration, the focusing of the mind on the object without distraction. Now these five jhana factors, as they are nurtured through the work of concentration, they counteract the five hindrances. The five jhana factors and the five hindrances are aligned with each other in a one-to-one relationship so that each jhana factor opposes and shuts out one hindrance. Thus, one-pointedness of mind counteracts sensual desire. Rapture overcomes ill will. Initial application shuts out dullness and drowsiness. Happiness or bliss overcomes restlessness and worry. And sustained application puts away doubt. So as these five factors emerge in the mind, they bring about a gradual purification of the mind from the hindrances. And when the five hindrances are fully suppressed, fully excluded, then the mind enters into a state called access concentration, upachara samadhi. The word upachara means suburb. So the mind in this state is now in the suburb or neighborhood of concentration. 
It's approaching the royal city of deep samadhi. The hindrances have been conquered, vanquished, but concentration is not yet fully matured. The texts compare access concentration to a baby or a child that's beginning to walk. He gets up, he walks a few steps, then he falls down again. But the meditator continues with his practice, continues to fix the mind on the object, striking at it again and again. As he does so, the jhana factors become stronger and stronger until when they reach full maturity, they plunge the mind into the object with the force of absorption. This is called upana samadhi, absorption concentration, full concentration, so that the mind becomes fixed upon the object without any wavering, without any vacillation or shaking. Now the mind is like a man who can get up from his seat and walk as long as he wants without falling down. The first level of full absorption is called the first jhana. The word jhana has no real adequate equivalent in English. We can call it absorption, but it's just as well to keep the Pali word jhana. There are four jhanas, each one deeper and subtler than the other. The first, they're called just that, and they're called just by their numerical sequence. The first jhana, the second jhana, the third jhana, and the fourth jhana. Each of the four jhanas is defined or constituted by a certain set of factors, which are the jhana factors. The first jhana has five factors, the five already mentioned, initial application, sustained application, rapture, happiness, and one-pointedness. In the second jhana, initial application and sustained application are eliminated. And so there are three factors, rapture, happiness, and one-pointed, and one-pointedness. In the third jhana, rapture is eliminated. And so there's two factors, happiness and one-pointedness. Then in the fourth jhana, happiness or pleasant feeling subsides and it's replaced by a different kind of feeling. It's called equanimous feeling or the feeling of equanimity. And so that jhana has two factors, the neutral feeling or the feeling of equ equanimity and again one-pointedness of mind. Now after attaining the first jhana, the meditator doesn't proceed right, at, right away to the next stage. First, he has to repeatedly enter the first jhana. He has to become thoroughly familiar with it, skillful in attaining it, and gain mastery over it. He perfects his attainment of the first jhana until he can enter it whenever he wants, remain as long as he wants, and emerge from it without difficulty. Now, at, when he masters the first jhana, he then begins to see that there are certain defects with this jhana. It's not completely subtle, not fully peaceful. It's still a little coarse and rough because it's disturbed by initial application and sustained application. And then the meditator aspires to reach a deeper level of absorption, the second jhana. So he makes an effort to develop stronger concentration, and when his faculties mature, then he enters the second jhana. He repeats the same thing, he masters the second jhana, then he sees that it has a defect, that it contains rapture, which is a relatively coarse factor. And he knows of the state beyond this, the third jhana, which is more peaceful and sublime. So he undertakes the practice for that when his faculties mature. Then he enters the third jhana. Again, he masters it. He sees that it's defective and that it contains happiness or pleasant feeling which is a coarse feeling compared to pure equanimity. And so he undertakes the practice for the deeper level of absorption, the fourth jhana. And when he reaches the fourth jhana, then he attains that state, which has equanimity and one-pointedness of mind. 
In the fourth jhana, the mind becomes completely still and silent, very, very still and pure. But beyond the fourth jhana, there are still four more levels of samadhi that can be achieved. These are called the immaterial or formless attainment. Their names are the attainment of the sphere of infinite space, the attainment of the sphere of infinite consciousness, the attainment of the sphere of nothingness, and the attainment of the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. These are very profound levels of samadhi, of concentration. And the last of these, the attainment of neither perception nor non-perception, this is the very pinnacle in the unification of consciousness. At this point, the, the mind becomes so still, so concentrated, that it's impossible even to say whether perception is present or not. This is the peak in the development of concentration. Now in all these states of samadhi, the four jhanas and the four formless attainments, the defilements are completely suppressed. However, the defilements are not eliminated. They're still present at the bottom of the mind in the form of latent tendencies. They're still lying dormant. And the reason that they're still lying dormant is because the fundamental root of all defilements is still present. This fundamental root is ignorance, the darkness of ignorance which covers over the true nature of phenomena. Therefore, in order to get free from the latent tendencies, one has to eliminate their support. One has to eliminate ignorance. And there is only one thing that can eliminate ignorance. It's direct opposite, panya or wisdom. The knowledge and vision of things as they really are. Therefore, after passing through the stages of jhana, the yogi has to emerge from absorption. But now that he's entered and passed through the jhanas, his mind has become very clear and pure, bright and luminous very soft and malleable. So having emerged from jhana, his faculties are fit and proper for developing vipassana, for practicing insight meditation. That is the procedure for one following the vehicle of serenity, to develop deep samadhi first to any level, either access, concentration, or to one of the jhanas, then go on to develop vipassana. One who follows the vehicle of insight or the dry insight method goes directly into contemplating the factors of mind and body without developing deep samadhi. But whatever approach he follows, the vehicle of serenity or the vehicle of insight, to develop insight, the yogi has to cultivate the four foundations of mindfulness, the mindful contemplation of the body, of the feelings, of states of mind, and of dhammas, the mind factors and mind objects. As he practices the four foundations of mindfulness, the field of experience becomes immediately accessible to him in very fine, detailed, microscopic focus. The aim of developing wisdom is to understand the actual nature of experience, to understand the nature of experience as it unfolds at the successive moments of experience. In the text, wisdom is defined as the knowledge which penetrates the true nature of dhammas, the true nature of phenomena. And it has the function of dispelling the darkness of ignorance which covers up the true nature of things. The phenomena which have to be known and, and penetrated, these are the states that constitute our own experience. Therefore, the attention of the meditator in the practice of insight meditation, his attention has to be bent back upon his own experience 
He has to turn his attention back upon the experience in order to understand the fundamental nature of the experiential process. At the first level, the meditator has to see his experience in terms of its constituting element. This is the analytical side to the cultivation of wisdom, to see the experience as a compounded process made up of many components. The root form of ignorance is the idea of a self, the false identification of oneself as a subsistent ego entity. And what causes this illusion to arise is the tendency to grasp things as solid wholes, to see them as monolithic unities, rather than to see the complex nature of things, to see the interwoven, intertwining nature of things. To correct this error, this illusion, the experience has to be broken down into its components. And that means to break it down into the five aggregates. When we look at the experience just as it is, we see many elements fused together, functioning in unison. First, there's the material form, the body, the sense organs, the sense objects. Then there are the feelings, the perceptions, the volitions and consciousness the mental side to the process. So the yogi, the meditator, learns to see each occasion of experience as occurring from the integral functioning of the five aggregates. Then the yogi puts the aggregate of material form on one side as materiality. On the other side, he puts the four mental aggregates which he classifies as mentality. And so he then sees the experience as occurring through the unified flow of these two streams of events, the stream of mental events, or the stream of material events, and the stream of mental events. And he sees them as constituted entirely by these two streams, without any self underlying them without any permanent subject supporting and upholding them. Then he sees that these two streams of events are just conditionally arisen phenomena. They have no being in themselves, no power of independent existence, but they occur in dependence on specific conditions and cannot occur in the absence of those conditions. It is at the next stage that the practice of vipassana actually begins. Vipassana is to see the true nature of phenomena, and this means to see the five aggregates in terms of the universal, all-pervading characteristics, the three characteristics of anicca, dukkha, anatta, that is, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and selflessness. And so the meditator investigates each of the aggregates in turn, learning to discover the three characteristics. He looks at the material form of the body. He sees that all bodily states are impermanent in the sense that they are subject to destruction. They arise, subsist momentarily, and pass away. He applies the same to the four mental aggregates, the feelings, perceptions, the mental formations and consciousness are all impermanent. They arise, break up, and pass away. Then all the five aggregates are dukkha, subject to unsatisfactoriness, in the sense that they can't provide any permanent basis for security. They are unreliable, subject to the afflictions of aging and death. And again, they are all selfless without any ego, without any intrinsic core of substance, just momentary happening, without any self at their base. So having examined his experience in terms of the three characteristics, 
to sharpen his insight, the meditator begins contemplating the rise and fall of these phenomena. He watches the material form of the body, the states of feeling, the perceptions, the mental formations and consciousness arise and fall away, arise and fall away. And as he contemplates the rise and fall, the three characteristics become clearer, more evident, more pronounced. Then to deepen his insight, the yogi drops his attention to the arising phase and focus ex focuses exclusively on the last stage in the process, the stage of breaking up of dissolution. When he does so, he sees that all the formations of existence are subject to destruction. They all break up and dissolve immediately after they arise. This insight into dissolution leads to the realization that no security can be found in conditioned existence. Nothing in the world can be relied on. Nothing can be held to for protection and shelter. As he sees the insecurity of all the things in the world, then his insight into the unsatisfactory nature of existence matures. His mind begins to turn away from all the things in the world. Now there arises a strong desire for emancipation, and that desire leads to a deepening of the power of insight. The mind penetrates to deeper levels of understanding until it reaches a stage of profound equanimity where the yogi looks upon all conditioned states as impermanent suffering and without a self, but he has no fear, no disgust, no sorrow. He has complete equanimity as he's watching the process. This stage marks the highest level in the development of insight. What lies beyond this is the stage of the supramundane paths and fruits. As the meditator goes on contemplating, when his mental faculties become fully mature, a sudden radical change takes place. Suddenly the meditator realizes that the supramundane path is about to arise. The supramundane path is a state of consciousness, a chitta, with the special function of realizing Nibbana and eradicating defilements. There are four supramundane paths, successive states of such consciousness. These come in distinct stages with the time interval between them. Each one realizes Nibbana for a single moment and eradicates certain defilements right down to the level of latent tendency. The first path to arise is called the path of stream entry. It's the first stage in the realization of Nibbana. So after the meditator reaches the peak of insight, his mind turns away from all the formations of existence and attains the path of stream entry. And for this brief moment, it penetrates the unconditioned element, Nibbana. It leaves behind all conditioned states and directly perceives, directly realizes the deathless state, the deathless state. And simultaneously with the realization of Nibbana, three defilements get cut off right down to the level of the latent tendencies. The defilements that keep beings bound to samsara are called fetters, sanyojana. They're called fetters because they keep beings chained to the wheel of birth and death. There are ten such fetters which are eradicated in different stages by the four paths. The first path, the path of stream entry, eradicates the first three fetters. That is, the fetter of personality view, the view of a truly existing self which can be identified with the five aggregates. The second fetter is doubt, perplexity, and the third is clinging to rules and rituals. And as soon as the mind enters the path of stream entry and sees Nibbana, these three fetters are all broken simultaneously 
at once. Now the moment of the path is immediately followed by a few moments of another type of consciousness which also experiences Nibbana. This type of consciousness is called fruition. Each path has its corresponding fruition coming immediately after itself and the fruit has the same name as the path. Thus the first fruition is called the fruit of stream entry. It's a sequence of a few moments of consciousness which experience or enjoy the results of the path. They experience the bliss and peace of Nibbana right after the defilements have been eradicated by the path. We can understand the relation of the path and the fruit in this way. The Suppose there is a man who is bound by chains. Suddenly he exerts all of his energy and he breaks the chains. The moment of breaking the chains, this is like the moment of the path when the fetters are eradicated. But as soon as he breaks the chains, he feels great relief, joy and happiness, a sense of freedom. This moment of happiness, or these moments of happiness, that is like the moments of fruition that follow the path. Now after passing through the path of stream entry, the yogi becomes a stream enterer. He becomes an Aryan, a noble person. He's risen up to a whole new level of being. He's entered the stream of the Dhamma. He's not yet fully liberated, but he's bound for full liberation. He is irreversible. He can never fall away from the goal of reaching full enlightenment and liberation. At the maximum, he will reach final Nibbana in seven lives, which will be spent in the human world or in the heavenly world. He can no longer take rebirth in the four states of misery in the hells among the animals as a as an afflicted spirit or as a titan his spiritual progress will continue from life to life and now we're going to cover all the levels of attainment and so after reaching the stage of stream entry the yogi wants to progress further to reach the next stage of liberation he again undertakes the cultivation of insight he passes through the different levels of insight. When he reaches the highest point, when his faculties mature, he attains the second path called the path of the once returner. Now this path does not actually eradicate any fetters completely, but it weakens two fetters, the fetter of sense desire and the fetter of ill will. Then the yogi experiences the corresponding fruition and comes back to normal consciousness as a once returner. This means he run more time to the human world. Wishing to go further, he again develops insight. He reaches the highest level of insight and attains the third path, the path of the non-returner. This path eradicates the two fetters that were previously weakened, the fetter of sensual desire and the fetter of ill will. The yogi passes through the fruit, through the fruit, and he emerges a non-returner, an anagami. This means he will never again return to the human world or to any heavenly world in the sense sphere. If he doesn't reach full deliverance in this life, he will take rebirth in a special heavenly plane called the pure abode, and there he will reach final deliverance. But now the yogi wants to reach the final goal in this life. And so he begins to develop insight. He goes up the ladder of insight realization. And at the peak, he reaches the fourth path, the path of arhatship. With this path, he eradicates the five remaining fetters. That is, the desire for existence in the realms of fine material form and in the immaterial forms, that's the sixth and seventh fetters. He eradicates conceit, which here means not the coarse conceit of pride, but the subtle conceit of an existing I. Then he cuts off restlessness, the fundamental agitation present in every mind that's not fully enlightened. And at last he eradicates ignorance, the most basic fetter. Following the path, he experiences the fruit of our hardship, and then he emerges as an arhant, 
an accomplished one, someone who's completed his training and lives in the experience of Nibbana. As an arhant, he's no more tied to the round of becoming, but he abides in peace through the rest of his days, and with his passing away, he attains the final goal, the Nibbana element, without residue remaining. And that is the consummation, the end of the path. Now we will conclude this talk with some practical instructions on meditation. Probably the most fundamental method of meditation taught in the Buddhist tradition is anapanasati, the mindfulness of breathing. This method is often taught to beginners, but it can also lead to all of the higher stages of the path, both in serenity and insight. It can even lead up to full enlightenment. In fact, it was the mindfulness of breathing meditation that was used by the Buddha on the night of his enlightenment. We can begin our explanation by saying some words about the right sitting position. Throughout the Buddhist tradition, meditation is practiced generally in the cross-legged posture, sitting on the floor. And even though this might cause some pain and discomfort at the beginning, it's advisable for those who are physically capable of it to try to use this method. We'll probably get, take some time to get accustomed to it, but it will be worth the effort since it will be most valuable in the long run. It gives a firmness and stability that's difficult to achieve when sitting in a chair. And to give some support to the body, to the bottom especially, it's good to use a cushion, a cushion that's not too soft, and about three or four inches high. If you don't have a cushion, then you can use a set of folded blankets. You might also put a soft rug or blanket underneath the knees to prevent the knees from getting pained during the course of sitting. And when sitting on the floor, it's not necessary to take the full lotus posture. In fact, this should be avoided except by those who are already able to sit in that position for long periods. It's better to learn to sit in a fairly comfortable position than to sit in excruciating pain from the start. So instead of the full lotus, you could sit in the half lotus position, that is, with one foot resting on the opposite thigh. Or else you could take the quarter lotus position, where you have one lower leg lying on top of the other. And if that's too difficult to manage, you can try the lion posture where you have the two lower legs lying alongside each other on the ground. The legs do not cross at all. But if you can't manage with any of these positions, then you can sit on a straight back chair, sitting straight up with the feet on the ground. And whatever position is used, it's most important to hold the upper part of the body erect. The back should be straight, but without strain or tension. If the body is too slack, then drowsiness will come. But if it's too rigid, that will result in agitation and tension. Here, the best way is the middle way, erect yet relaxed, not too tight, not too loose. Then the head should be upright, veering neither to the left nor to the right, but the head can be tilted just a wee bit forward. The eyes can be closed or half closed, whichever feels most comfortable. The hand should be placed on the lap, the right hand on top of the left, the thumbs touching. The mouth should be closed and all breathing should take place through the nose. Then once we can sit in the correct physical posture, we have to know how to deal with the mind. The untrained mind, the mind that's not disciplined in meditation, generally flits from thought to thought, very often without any control or reason, just roaming and wandering restlessly. To develop the mind for calm and insight, we have to learn to focus the mind, to train it to remain on its object. And the object we use in the meditation on breathing is the breath itself, 
the in and out movement of the breathing. We breathe mindfully, aware of the movement of the breath, observing the normal flow of breath. And the breathing done in this meditation should be done entirely naturally. There should be no effort to interfere with the movement of the breath, to control it, to hold it in, or to breathe forcefully. Just breathe at the normal rate and observe the movement of the breath with mindfulness. And to train the mind, we have to have a place to fix the mind. And the place where we fix the attention is the area around the nostrils or on the upper lip, wherever one feels the touch sensation of the air coming in and going out. The actual object of attention is that touch sensation, the sensation of the breath coming in and going out. You shouldn't follow the breath into the lungs, you shouldn't follow it out into the air, but just keep the mind posted at the door of the nostrils, mindfully aware of the touch sensation, in and out, in and out. The mind should be like a sent sentinel keeping watch at the door of the nostrils. Just remains there, checking the visitors, the visiting breath coming in, the visiting breath going out, without moving into the body or out into space. And to help keep the mind on the breath, it's helpful to make a mental note when breathing in, make the mental note in, in. When breathing out, make the mental note out, out. And one should keep the awareness constant through all phases of each movement, with the in-breath from the beginning of the in-breath through the middle, down to the end, then from the beginning of the out-breath through the middle to the end. For the in-breath, make the mental note in, in. For the out-breath, make the mental note out, out. Some teachers recommend counting the breaths for each inhalation and exhalation, one, two, three, and so on, up to ten. But most uh, practitioners or many practitioners have found that this method gets confusing. And so we advise just using the mental notes of in and out, in and out. But the attention itself should be on the breath sensation, not on the mental notes. We just use the mental notes to keep the mind on the sensation. There's an alternative way of doing this meditation introduced in Burma in recent, year, in recent years. This is to make the object of attention the rising and falling movement of the abdomen rather than the touch sensation of the breath. As we breathe in, you notice the abdomen rises. When you breathe out, you notice the abdomen falls. And so we follow this rising and falling movement of the abdomen that accompanies the in and out breathing. This movement is grosser than the touch sensation of the breath, and therefore many people find it easier to follow. In following the rising movement, we make the mental note rising, rising. When following the falling movement, we make the mental note falling, falling. And try to follow the entire movement the rising from beginning to end, the falling from beginning to end. And pay attention to the actual bodily sensation of rising and falling, not to any mental images of them or to the mental notes. You can try both methods at first, the touch sensation and the rising and falling of the abdomen. Then you could try to find out which one is easiest to follow. Try them both and then choose one. But once you choose one of these methods, then you should follow it through to the end. You shouldn't go switching back and forth from one to another. That only leads to confusion. But having chosen one, just make the resolution to stay with it. Now, whichever one, whichever method you choose, certain obstacles are bound to arise. We might mention some of these. <laughs> The most obvious obstacle is the wandering of the mind. Very easily the mind tends to stray to other thoughts, 
thoughts about the past, about the future, about the present, about work, pleasure, friends, enemies, and so on. Whatever stray thoughts arise, you just note them. Wandering thoughts, wandering thoughts. Then let them go and bring the mind back to the object, to the touch sensation of the breath, or to the rising and falling movement of the abdomen. Don't comment on the thoughts. Don't become disturbed by them. Don't hang on to them. Don't get carried away by them. And don't try to force them to go away. Just make the mental note. Wandering mind, wandering mind, stray thoughts, stray thoughts. Then let them go by themselves and bring the mind back gently but firmly to the subject. The same applies if you hear sounds, sounds from the outside, traffic, voices, and so on. Just don't become disturbed by the sounds or discouraged by them. Just make the mental note, hearing, hearing, then let go of the sounds and bring the mind back to the subject. Also, sometimes mental images will arise, pictorial images, memories, imaginations. Just make the mental note, seeing, seeing, let go of the mental images, bring the mind back to the subject. The touch sensation of the breathing, rise and fall of the abdomen. Another problem that can arise are painful sensations in the body, especially at the outset, pains in the legs or in the back. When pains arise and one shouldn't start shifting the body or moving about, but just make the mental note, pain, pain, or sensation, sensation, then let the pain go, let it continue on its way, but you bring the mind back to the primary subject, the breath or to the rising and falling. Also, if itching takes place, don't start moving to scratch the itch. Just note the itching sensation, itching, itching, then let it go its own way and bring the mind back to the subject. But when pain arises in the legs, if the pain gets too strong will it, when it really interferes seriously with your concentration, then you can just mindfully readjust the posture to a more comfortable one and then go back to the primary subject. The meditation on breathing can be extended either into the level of deep serenity or else it can be made a foundation for the practice of vipassana or insight meditation depending on the mode. But here we don't have to describe these advanced details. At the outset, it's just important to develop this fundamental mindfulness, observing the in and out movement of the breath or the rising and falling of the abdomen. There are many other subjects of meditation, but time only allows us to mention this one method here as a foundation for practice.